We go into Romans chapter 3 for those who aren't with us. Uh, if they are, then we have been studying through the book of Romans. I've uh, been trying to teach at least, and we finished up chapter 2 last week. So just as a, a recap, chapter 2 started out largely with the universality of God's judgment. It didn't matter if you were Jew or Gentile, whether you were under the law or not, you would, outside of Christ, you would face God's judgment. And even us that are saved will give an answer before God. Amen. And also, he points out how that salvation was without respect to persons. And it wasn't exclusively for the Jews or exclusively for Gentiles. Or it seems to be uh, our thought today it's exclusively for America, but it's not. Right. But then the last half, he, he begins to point out the hypocrisy of the, of the Jews and really the irrelig religious people. How that equates to many today that are simply religious and not truly serving God. Right. Well, they didn't, the Jews and many today, they won't practice what they preach, teach, and believe. Well, they would they say one thing and then do the opposite. They would teach one thing and then transgress against what they were teaching against. Right. And then the chapter concludes with. The importance of inward change versus outward shows the pledge. How that really circumcision was nothing and uncircumcision was nothing. When we begin here in chapter 3, several questions are raised and objections that Paul knew would be brought up. Lord, we look at verses 1 through 4 today. He says, verse 1, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there in a circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Amen. Let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art good. So here he begins with the question What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what, what is the benefit of being a Jew. When I say work, the Jews had a superior position and they certainly thought so. He mm -hmm. says, well, what advantage is that then if someone can be a Jew inwardly who was not born a Jew naturally? If they were the favored people of God. They, for thousands of years, were the chosen nation. But yet, Paul had just spend several verses in the chapter basically tearing them apart and telling them that they're no better off than the Gentiles. Right. So if anyone could become a Jew, spiritually speaking, then was there any advantage of being a natural Jew and being raised a Jew and in the religious, the religion of the Jews? Well, the Jews, they said so they thought much of themselves and much of their religion and much of their rituals and practices. Right. They were often very proud and boastful about it. Mm -hmm. Really, was there? There's no spiritual advantage of those things if it's not applied the right way. He then goes on to say, "What profit is there of circumcision?" There's certainly a, a fleshly benefit to circumcision, we know today, but that's not what he is speaking of here. Circumcision was the sign of covenant between God and Abraham. Mm -hmm. So is there any profit or is there any benefit or usefulness in circumcision? If you're uncircumcision, we can become circumcision. And if you're circumcision, can become uncircumcision. You know, if one does not keep the law, you know, the chapter there, the verse number 27, or no, excuse me, verse number 26 and 25 says, Circumcision is barely product if thou keep the law, but thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Mm -hmm. Verse 26, therefore, the circumcision keeps the righteousness of the law, shall, his, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Right. But really, what, what point was there in circumcision? What, 
the Jews were going to ask to follow. Yet, it said it was the covenant between God and his people, the sign of it. It was what showed that Israel was separate from the world, that they were not the same as the other nations. Right. But yet, not applied correctly, it was of no use. Right. As we saw last week, what makes the ultimate difference is if we are a new creature in Christ or not. We've had that circumcision of the hearts rather than the circumcision of the flesh. Amen. Well, on verse 2, Paul begins to answer his question here, and he says, Much every way. Really, in every way, the Jews had the advantage. Mm -hmm. So, for thousands of years, they were the chosen nation of God. They were really the only ones who had the true God on their side. Amen. And Christ would come out of them. You know, Messiah, the Savior, he would be born of the Jews and would live among them. And as Paul pointed out here, most importantly, they had the law and the prophets. They had a lot of advantages over the Gentile peoples up to this point. He says in the next part of the verse there, chiefly because that under them were committed the oracles of God. Well, chiefly or primarily, he says, firstly, because they were given the oracles of God. They were, they were entrusted with the word of God. He didn't come to the Gentile nations. By and large, Gentiles were a heathen people. Right. Aside from only a few exceptions, the Gentiles, up until the time of Christ, were all lost folks, all without the mercy and grace of God. Amen. Yet under the Jews, under the people of Israel, was entrusted they call it here the oracles of God, or the word of God, the, the law and the prophets primarily is what it consisted of. We know the law and the prophets pointed to Christ. It had many types and shadows of Christ. The sacrifices all pointed to Christ. They had all these signs that Christ was coming. They had also the, the signs and the wonders of the Old Testament. Yet this was an advantage that the they could pick up the Word of God and read what God required of them. Right. They could pick up the Scriptures and read what was coming. They could read of a better sacrifice that was on the way. Amen. And yet the other nations did not have this. They had the standard of God's righteousness. They had the very truth of God. And that was not to be found among the world. Right. They had everything that pointed them to salvation. And yet, I'd say the far majority of them missed it. Yeah. <coughs> it would be much like today. We as <coughs> Baptists have the truth of the Word of God, don't we? Right. Yeah. We have the gospel. It's not been given unto just anybody. There's lots of so-called churches out there. There's lots of other religions. And yet none of them have the truth of the Word of God. You're right. So in that sense, it is an advantage. That we have mm -hmm. the ways of God before us. We have the way of salvation very clearly before us. And yet that is something to be thankful to God for, but it's certainly not something to boast in the flesh of God. Yet without... God applying that in our hearts so it will make a little difference. <coughs> if anything, it will stand as a judgment against us. Right. You know, I don't like to pick on the ladies, but Sarah's not here, so I guess I'll talk about her. <laughs> you know, she has went to a sound church all of her life, as far as I know. She's heard the gospel, I'm sure, hundreds of times, and yet God has not made it effectual in her heart. The Jews were very much like that, weren't they? Mm -hmm. They knew all about the Word of God. I'm sure Sarah could tell you more about the Bible than a lot of professing Christians could. And yet, 
that in and of itself cannot save a person. Amen. The Jews, they knew all about the Word of God. The Pharisees, they studied in and out. They knew the law and all that required, and yet that was not enough to save them. Just as for us today, it's not enough for us just to know the truth, but we must believe the truth. Amen. Well, he says that they were committed to the oracles of God. Verse 3 he goes on with, with another question. For what if some did not believe? You know, said the Jews, they had all of this truth of the word of God, all the sacrifices, all the types and shadows of the coming Messiah. Yet not all of them believed. Mm -hmm. It is very evident in the Old Testament that not all of them believed. For in his crew, I think God opened the earth and just dropped them straight off into hell. But mm -hmm. There's many that were disobedient, the sons of Eli, who were called the sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord, Scripture says. Okay. So, no, not all that were of Israel believed, even though they had everything right there before them so they could believe. Mm hmm. Just like everyone who attends a good sound church doesn't necessarily make them saved. Right. You know, I'd say probably by the time that Paul wrote this, most of the Jews only had an outward show of religion rather than a true faith anyway. Mm -hmm. I hope that can't be said of our churches though. But it does sometimes seem that we oftentimes have more of an outward show of religion more than a, a real faith that's within us. Right. So despite having all these advantages, despite being raised in accordance with the Word of God, these will never believe without a real work of God in their hearts. He goes on to say, Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Which the faith of God seems to mean the faithfulness and fidelity of God to His promises. He says, shall their unbelief make it without effect? Shall we make it void or make it unusable? Shall they invalidate or override God's faithfulness by their unbelief? That seems to be a foolish thought to us, doesn't it? But just as a side note, there were some that believed that all the Jews would be saved despite their disobedience and unbelief. That's never what the Old Testament covenant was about. In fact, it was very much that if you do this, I will do that type of covenant. But no, our unbelief cannot make God's promises without a faith. Well, our lack of faith does not make God any less faithful. Well, our you know, even stubbornness and Hard-heartedness, cold-heartedness does not override the faithfulness of God. Amen. I say even to this day, God has been faithful to his promises, even to the nation of Israel. And we look throughout history and we see that they had it quite rough for a while, but God told them they were going to be dispersed among the nations. But to get some, was it been 70 Plus years ago now that God began gathering them back into a nation again because he is faithful to his promises. Amen. I believe by God's word that he will one day bring salvation to his people of, of the Jewish people again. That one day they will see Christ as their long-awaited Messiah. Amen. But we can be sure, even as the Gentile believers, that God will be faithful to his promises to us as well. You know, it may not always be on our time. It may not always be according to our schedule. Yet despite our faults and failures, God will always be faithful to his word. In verse 4, Paul answers his question in verse 3, and he says, God forbid. We might say absolutely not. One of the strongest negative that Paul could use in his vernacular that day, God forbid. And this will be the first time he uses that among several times throughout the book of Romans, but 
We shouldn't even let the thought come to our mind. You hadn't. That somehow we could void the faithfulness of God. And we follows it up with, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. God is true even if man says otherwise. Amen. And Titus 1 2 tells us that God cannot lie. Hebrews 6 18 tells us it's impossible for God to lie. So even if every human on the face of the earth were to proclaim something as fact, if it goes against God's word, what God has said, then God is still true and every man is a liar. Amen. Just as a side note, this is in contrast to the Muslim God who who's able to deceive his people. Our God is a very true God. Amen. Well, the God of the Bible, Jehovah, he is completely true and faithful to his promises. Amen. Well, let God be true with every man a liar, as it is written. This seems a this goes back to Psalms 51, verse 4. We'll turn over there in a minute and read it. Yeah. He says that thou mightest be justified in thy sins and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Well, Paul's quotation seems to align more closely with the Greek Septuagint than the Hebrew, but the meaning is still the same. So that thou might be justified in thy sins. It is that God is righteous and he is purely innocent of wickedness in Amen. everything that he says. You know, God is not, he does not speak with God. He does not speak in half truths or dishonesty. So everything God says is completely pure and innocent. Amen. It's completely in line with his righteous character and holiness. Sometimes we have we have a hard time reconciling those things in our carnal mind, but yet we know God is without sin in everything he says and does. So thou might be justified in thy sins and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Up here the subject and predicate seem reversed in the comparison to the Hebrew, but it's still the same that God is blameless when he judges and that the people of God are victorious when God judges. And when God judges his people, yet we are overcomers through Christ. Amen. Yeah, when God pronounces judgment, he is still very pure and holy in those judgments. Mm -hmm. They're always in accordance with his justice and righteousness. Let's turn back to Psalm 51. Before we close here, Psalms 51. Well, if you are, if you remember from Adam's class, I don't think anyone calls back that far. <laughs> when this particular psalm was written, who was written about? A tribute to David when he was convicted of his sin with Bathsheba and he cries out to God for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And that is significant to what Paul is saying. And when the first few verses here, he cries out in repentance. In verse number four, he says, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou might be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. The significance of Paul quoting from this particular psalm is that even though we are sinful, even though we fail, even though we fall short of the requirements of God, yet he is still faithful to his promises and to his word. Right. You know, David was, at this point in his life, was far into sin. He had slept with another man's wife and had killed that man, mm -hmm. had him killed in battle. And Yep, and when Nathan the prophet came to him, he didn't even, still didn't see what was wrong until Nathan said, Thou art the man. Right. Yet, despite how far David had gone in the sin, yet God was still faithful to his promises. 
God would still be faithful to his future promises to David as well. That the one that was, I think John Gill brought out about this passage was that David was promised that he would, of his seed, would come forth the Messiah. Right. Yet despite David's shortcomings, yet God was still faithful to that promise. Mm -hmm. well, there will be one that reigns forever from the throne of David. Amen. And that will be Christ. Amen. That is Christ, I can say. Amen. If David was not that much different than us. He was still a sinful man. And yet despite his sinfulness and his wickedness and his hypocrisy, yet God was still faithful. You know, I think that's what Paul is trying to drive home back in our text that though Israel had fallen away from God, though they had sinned against him, though they were a very idolatrous nation, yet God will still be faithful to his promises to them. Amen. And just the same, he will be faithful to his promises to us as well. That though we may fall to sin, though we may not always live up to the mark that we hope to live to, we certainly don't ever live completely up to the standard of God's word yet. That does not make God's promises void or without effect. Amen. Yeah. Yes, we, there's a lot. There was a lot of advantages to being a Jew. There's advantages to being raised in a good, sound church. Mm -hmm. But yet, we must be <laughs> changed by God. Is what ultimately will make the difference. Right. Being a Jew naturally didn't save them. Just like being a good Baptist today won't save you. You're right. Get to that inward change, that was what will make the difference. Amen. But be sure God will always be faithful to his promises. Yes. Well, then we'll continue here in two weeks. I guess Brother Junior to fill in for me next week. We'll go ahead and close with that thought. So.